Ben Shabibol is a man with a multitude of talents, columnist, author, political commentator, critic of Cardi B's WAP, wet ass P word. But in all seriousness, Ben, even at a young age, was a child prodigy. Having skipped two grades at school, he graduated from UCLA in 2004 and then from Harvard Law School in 2007. He even played violin at a young age. At age 17, he became the youngest syndicated columnist in the US. Currently, he works as the editor of the conservative news outlet The Daily Wire, which he founded, that has amassed millions of followers on YouTube alone. While Ben's success definitely comes from his hard work and dedication and not due to the fact that he was raised in an extremely privileged household with both of his parents working in Hollywood, it's important to note that Ben never really received any recognition until he started speaking at college campuses. You know, going up against nervous college students that are barely adults with his years of experience in media training, he was able to come up with such gems like Ben Shapiro destroys transgenderism and pro-abortion arguments, a video that amassed over 8 million views, granting him the title of provocative gladiator and the cool kids philosopher by the New York Times, where he falsely equated your gender identity with your age? Why aren't you 60? Why aren't you 60? <laughs> and why, why can't you identify as 60? Why, what, what is the problem with you identifying as 60? <laughs> ben later on goes on to coin his catchphrase, Facts don't care about your feelings. Facts don't care about your feelings. In a video of the same title by Prager U, another conservative news outlet founded by Dennis Prager with over 3 million subscribers on YouTube, the video in question that currently has over 6 million views, Ben opens it up by Vanderbilt University, November 2015. 200 students rise up to protest the white privilege and microaggressions of the racist, bigoted Vanderbilt administration. The protesters don't offer any specific examples of discrimination, but that doesn't matter. What matters is that they feel victimized. Except that's not really what happened. The students at the Vanderbilt University weren't protesting over nothing, nor they had no specific examples of discrimination. A simple Google search on the topic reveals that one of their professors at the time published an Islamophobic op-ed where they referred to Islam as not like other religions in the United States as it possesses an absolute danger to us and our children. Now, we can talk about the efficacy of protesting, how sometimes protesting can turn into rioting and do more harm than good, as Ben does later on in the video, but he's still wrong in the sense that they had a valid reason to protest. It wasn't just based on feeling victimized. We, we're we not even 20 seconds into the video and he already got one of the key facts wrong. In a video titled, Facts Don't Care About Your Feelings, with 6 million views, his biases took over reality, his feelings literally cared about the facts. You know what, let's move on from Ben for now because my brain turns into mush when I think about him. Jordan Peterson is a Canadian clinical psychologist and a professor of psychology in the University of Toronto, but he is best known for his takedowns of the woke PC culture in college campuses. He can be best described as more of a self-help guru than a professor, as his published books often delve into ways of bettering yourself by providing seemingly simple advice like clean your room, have good posture, set your house in order before you criticize the world. I don't want to delve too much into Peterson here because then I'll end up derailing like Peterson often does, but I found this article by Nathan J. Robinson from Current Affairs that searchingly goes over everything that is wrong with his rhetoric. One of the main things is that, although it may seem like Peterson speaks a lot of things that might sound insightful and articulate, he doesn't actually say anything. He sort of derails and rambles and goes on a million tangents and you never really know for sure what he's getting at or what he stands for. Like his chapter on having good posture in his book 12 Rules for Life and Antidote to Chaos, it doesn't take a PhD to know how having good posture is beneficial for both your mental and physical health. Yet, 
Peterson would stretch out a 30-page chapter on this, talking about how lobsters claim territory, then how birds claim territory, and then how hierarchies exist in nature, all to say, stand up straight with your shoulders back. This is one of the reasons why Peterson is so controversial, as there are people who see him as some sort of a self-help prophet that is here to save them, to people that think he's an outright fascist. The reason there is such a broad spectrum of interpretations made on a single individual is because, as the article points out, his vacuous words are kind of a Rorschach test onto which countless interpretations can be projected. But going back to college campuses, Peterson's rise to fame actually comes from a college campus. One of the very first videos of him on YouTube was at a college campus, where he refused to use the right pronouns for a trans person. You have no idea if I'm your enemy. You have no idea about me. You won't use my pronouns, so I'm pretty sure you're my enemy, yes. Yeah, well, I know you think that, but I don't believe that using your pronouns is going to do you any good in the long run. I think it'll do quite the contrary. What? If you haven't picked up yet, a lot of the conservative right-wing figureheads on YouTube gained their fame from essentially being disruptive at college campuses. Steven Crowder is another example of this, who is a failed comedian turned into a political commentator and media host. Currently sitting at nearly 6 million subscribers on YouTube, his series Changed My Mind went viral 5-6 to six years ago, racking up millions of views. His most popular video to this day is a change my mind video that has over 44 million views and you guessed it it took place at a college campus the base premise of this series is the most phony attempt at a public debate that you can think of with him coming up with the topic him sitting with his list of sources and evidence him holding the mic having all the editorial control and you as some random person on the streets going about your day are supposed to sit down with him and change his mind on his chosen topic with no preparation whatsoever. But here's the kicker, Crowder doesn't actually want his mind changed. He is well aware of this power dynamic. In some episodes, he even has a crowd of his fans and supporters egging him on. It's not about learning something new or, Lord forbid, actually changing your mind. It's about winning the argument, humiliating the opponent in the process, even if that meant coming up with the worst talking points imaginable. It's the idea that there have been different genders outside of man-woman for centuries. Okay. Okay, how so? Yeah, uh, India. Yeah, India. In sure. India, you know, they have their gender. Native American cultures, they have their genders. Sure. In ancient Egypt, they had their genders. Okay. You know, so that's a very, it's a very Western idea to say that there are only two genders and that this whole thing is a new idea changing our Well, culture, you know what else is a very society. Western idea? So you're, it seems to me your, your, your presupposition there, correct me if I'm wrong, is that because other cultures have done this, there's a precedent. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. I don't think that well, we're her do, hermetically sealed in any way. So you do realize, um, and you talked about how very different it was from Western culture, so antithetical to Western culture, you named India, ancient Egypt. You know what else uh, we also uh, believe in that's antithetical to those cultures? We're against slavery. What? While this college campus, wokeness, PC culture, moral panic definitely had its heydays back in 2015 to 2016, so around five to six years ago, there are still a lot more conservative right-wing figures on YouTube now that have gained a following by riding on its coattails, such as Caitlin Bennett from the channel Liberty Hangout with over 600,000 subscribers, who basically built her channel by attempting to dunk on college students often through embarrassing herself in the process. If you were to walk into the women's restroom and you saw a woman with a penis there using a urinal, would you be concerned or would you accept it and be inclusive? What would you do? Um, it's none of my business. So it's none of your business that a man no. is in the women's restroom. If they're in the women's restroom, then they identify as a woman. Oh. There are also channels like Campus Reform, which is based entirely on college campuses, down to the SJW compilations, many of whom attack college students. All of this to me begs the question, what's with all these people and college campuses? Like, why college campus out of all places? There are millions of videos made, books written, documentaries, segments in popular animated TV shows.
This was the home of ruthless media disruptor Samuel F.B. Morse. Who's his successor? That fellow? Fellow. That word is cisgender normative, okay? You're worse than Hitler! Too late for flattery. I'm not giving this school a dime. I mean, what did some nervous, barely adult college student ever do to you to grant this sort of reaction? While both the conservatives and the center-right liberals have numerous complaints against college campuses, from rape culture to affirmative action, the consensus seems to be is that modern college campuses are indoctrinating the youth through brainwashing them with liberal ideology, political correctness, and wokeness, thus stifling the First Amendment of the freedom of speech. The 2019 documentary No Safe Spaces starring Dennis Prager and Adam Carolla explores this idea by claiming that America has always been the land of the free where you can say whatever you want, and college campuses preventing that with their wokeness, trigger warnings, and safe spaces is a new thing that only started happening a decade ago. What's happening now in the United States, you are not to be heard on a college campus or at your place of work. This is brand new. This is one of the few things one could say we have no precedent for in the United States. But does that hold truth? A paper published by Virginia Law Review titled The Miseducation of Free Speech quotes soon-to-be Supreme Court Justice Lewis Powell, frightening progress has been made toward radicalizing the campus. The movement has engulfed many of the most prestigious universities and is a recognized influence on almost every campus. Colleges have been shut down, files looted, manuscripts destroyed, and buildings burned. Freedom of speech has been denied, recent discourse repudiated, and academic freedom endangered. This was taken from a newspaper editorial published in 1971, yet it still sounds like something that could have easily be said by Dennis Prager or any other conservative pundits today. The reality is, college students or the youth in general have always protested against social issues, and likewise, the conservatives have always spoken out against that under the defense of free speech. This is nothing new. In fact, the paper opens up with this line in the introduction. The claim that America's campuses are in the midst of a free speech crisis has been made so often and so empathetically that it has widely become accepted as fact. But even if this hasn't been a new idea, you can still argue that maybe over the last decade or so as the society has become more progressive, it has been enforced more, it has been stifled more, and thus making it more difficult for conservatives to voice their opinion. So what examples does Dennis provide to back up this claim? Early on in the documentary, Dennis Prager and Adam Carolla bring up an incident in 2016 where they were invited to speak at California State University only for the event to get cancelled two weeks prior to it was supposed to be held. Dennis and Adam claimed that this was due to the content of their presentation that was deemed to be politically incorrect by the administration, which could incite protests. They had fully approved you and me being there. They then cancelled it because of the topic. But doing a bit of digging into the event, it turns out that the event was really cancelled due to logistical reasons. As the statement put out by the administration points out, based on the typical end of semester increased activity, the university corporation determined that this rental request could not be accommodated. Therefore, at no point was the rental approved. Representatives made an inquiry and logistics could not be accommodated. Another thing that is important to note is that Dennis and Adam have already been to this particular university before and were able to provide a speech and have a platform with no issues. We were going to do an event, you and I. And we've done events there before. And we've done before. So it seems odd that now, all of a sudden, the university administration is going to have an issue with the content of their presentation, assuming that it's likely not going to be much different to the presentation that they held prior. And the fact that that this was their prime example, the quintessential evidence that they could come up with on how free speech in college campuses is under attack. Never has a thesis been so confirmed, 
so rapidly. It goes to show how baseless this claim is. I mean, if it really is such a pressing issue, why not show more recent examples than something that happened three years prior to the documentary's release? Like I mentioned, the free speech moral panic had its heydays between 2015 to 2016, and the documentary is riddled with footage and stories from that era. It brings up people like Marlo Yiannopoulos, a right-wing British activist who hasn't even been in the public eye since 2017. This is old news. And for a seemingly contemporary issue like conservatives claim it is, using events from 2016 in a documentary that was released in 2019 feels like flogging a dead horse. <laughs> But say, even if hypothetically, it really was the content of Dennis and Adam's presentation that led to it being cancelled due to the fear of protest, but that still doesn't mean that free speech is under attack. Freedom of speech protects you from the government, not from the people. It entitles you a right to your opinion, but not a right to a platform or a megaphone. Freedom of speech is not freedom of consequences. Just as you're allowed to have your opinion, people are allowed to disagree agree, protest against you, and choose not to invite you at their campuses. I mean, it is no surprise that when conservatives use the veneer of free speech to argue for their points, what they're really doing is justifying their hatred. So much of this free speech debate in the right wing is about how they should be allowed to say something. Even if you don't agree, even if it's unpopular, you have the right to say it. Which, if you have to defend this much for the right to your opinion, Maybe there is something wrong with her opinion. Just saying. Give me an example. Those of you who said that you think there should be restrictions, give me an example of what should not be allowed to be said. I would say like anybody, like you have Nazi beliefs or values and you raise those because that can make people uncomfortable or that. Okay, that's very important. So I'm a Jew and Nazis killed six million Jews. That's one out of every three Jews on earth was, was was annihilated in World War II by the Nazis. So I have a real hatred to Nazis. But I believe they should be allowed to march freely in America. Because if we say to the Nazi today, you can't speak, then we'll say to a non-Nazi tomorrow, you can't speak either. And we hope that if everybody speaks, the good ideas will win. Yeah, that sounds very idealistic, but it is not the case. Because in the world that we live in, Good ideas don't always win, especially if they're in favor of people that hold a majority of the political power in society. If they come for the Nazis, they can come for you, is ironically what the Nazis did leading up to the Holocaust. The first groups that the Nazis went after were people with mental and physical disabilities. Countless propaganda posters, films were made advocating for forcibly sterilizing and euthanizing the disabled. Then it was trans people. The gays, black people, then finally the Jews. In an ideal world where everybody is equal and have had similar opportunities in their lives, then yeah, sure, the type of freedom of speech that Dennis is promoting could probably work. But in reality, there are systemic injustices that plague our society to this day. You know, the Nazis weren't just bad because they were mean and offensive and made people feel uncomfortable, but because they wanted to exterminate an entire population of people, and they came very close to doing so. The Nazi example that Dennis used in this scene was pretty distasteful in my opinion, because less than two years before the release of this documentary, that's exactly what happened in Charlottesville, the Unite the Right rally where neo-Nazis marched freely, waving their swastika flags, led to the death of an individual and 35 injured due to a car attack. Even today, with anti-Semitic attacks on the rise, it's very clear who truly holds power in this society and who is a downtrodden. And then there is the claim of college professors and administration brainwashing the youth by pushing a liberal agenda, which again is not some new cutting-edge claim, yet some conservative pundits like Charlie Kirk from Turning Point USA went as far as to create a website placing some of these professors on a watch list for supposedly advancing leftist propaganda in classrooms and discriminating against conservative students. Jeez. Sounds like somebody is feeling victimized. 
While it is true that most college-educated individuals tend to be liberals or are generally more left-leaning, this is not due to some conspiracy in college campuses that the elites or the people higher up the food chain are indoctrinating and brainwashing the youth by pushing diversity programs and liberal ideology. But rather, college campuses, depending on how big or prestigious the institution is, actually do tend to be some of the most diverse places to exist. People from all walks of life, with a diverse range of differences from age, race, gender, sexuality, come together for the shared goal of receiving an education. Which is one of the reasons why, when people first go off to college, they usually feel a sense of epiphany as they realize how big the world truly really is, as for most people that have probably spent a majority of their lives in their hometowns that perhaps have never gotten the chance to interact with people that are different to them, it allows their bubble to burst and create room for growth as a person. However, with that being said, when you do have so many different people at one place for a significant amount of time, it is necessary to set up some rules and boundaries for them to simply function and get on with their lives. You you sort of need to have a liberal, flexible, open-minded approach as the rigid structures that are typically enforced by the conservatives is not going to work in such cases. So it's not really the college administration pushing for a liberal agenda, but rather the environment in college campuses requiring a liberal perspective to simply function. Also, one of universities and colleges' goals is to make money, in countries where education isn't free at least. And right now, with how the society is headed, being pro-LGBT, Black Lives Matter, and generally associating with social issues that are seen as more progressive and liberal, is becoming more accepted and therefore is going to bring in the most money. But despite how much conservatives champion freedom of speech or diversity of thoughts or free marketplace of ideas, the reality is that there is nothing more that they hate. When they cry out freedom of speech, what they really mean is their freedom to spout out hatred. There is a reason why so many conservative, evangelical Christians would often choose to pull their children out of school and opt for homeschooling instead. Aside from having more authority, control, and power over their children, it's about sheltering them from ideas that are different to their own, especially progressive ideas. Because deep down they know that when light is shed on their beliefs, they could get caught as to how abusive and authoritarian they are. And that is the real indoctrination, not some college administration implementing diversity policy. This also ties in with the anti-intellectualism that is prevalent in American culture, which refers to hostility, distrust, and dismissal of science, academics, and higher education. We have seen this with the QAnon kids. These people that believe that politics and media are being controlled by Satan worshipping pedophiles and everything in between often choose to homeschool their kids away from other children, not just to shelter their kids, but because of the fear of this enemy that they have created that can be anyone from a liberal to Joe Biden himself. Biden's a child molester and he kidnaps children and does horrible things to them just like Hillary Clinton and Obama who made the virus. They are very very good kids we're very blessed and yeah. that's why I'm comfortable with making the decision to keep them out of school even that means they don't have all the friends to be around and you know. I don't want my kids wearing a mask. It's sad that they don't have a lot of friends to play with, but I think in the long run, they'll be better adults, mm -hmm. having a better education than being popular. This is especially true for some Christian conservatives that see homosexuality or queerness in general as some sort of a disease, like a contagion that is out to recruit children for their cult, which is why the moment their child starts to dress differently or, Lord forbid, actually come out as anything other than cisgender heterosexual, one of the first things that they do is pull them out of school. About a year ago, this tweet by Brett Dutton gained a lot of traction where she claimed, I did not affect my daughter. I removed her from the contagion. Within months, she pulled what I called a cease and desist. She saw the truth and left the cult. Over a year later, she's striving more than she ever was when involved in gender craze. Hashtag young GC women unite. 
And how did she remove her from this so-called contagion, you may ask? By pulling her out of school, removing her social media, monitoring her every single move, even encouraging other parents to do so, pretty much socially isolating her as much as possible until she had no choice but to give in. Now, according to her, her daughter is thriving and doing a lot better than she ever was, and she proved it by posting pictures of her minor daughter, so great. While I'm not denying that there are definitely kids out there who may once think that they are trans and later on realize that they're not and go back to living the way that they used to in accordance to their assigned gender, nothing wrong with that. But socially isolating your child, pulling them out of school, removing their social media, forcing them to be in this bubble by sheltering them from anything queer, is not the way to go about it. Not to mention this sort of living arrangement where the kids have no interaction with anyone aside from their immediate family can be incredibly dangerous if their family is abusive, if they are neglectful as it happens with many queer kids because there is no way those kids would be able to ask for help from another adult or anyone for that matter as to what is truly happening to them behind closed doors. In her 2021 book, Deceased D. Trank's Detox, Getting Your Child Out of the Gender Cult, author Maria Keffler provides what is essentially a step-by-step -step manual for conversion therapy for trans children. On top of recommending parents to pull their children out of school, Keffler at one point suggests that you pretty much starve your children until they give up by giving in to your demands. Say, for example, you want your transgender identified child to stop ignoring you when you use her given name rather than calling her by her chosen trans name. The target behavior you want to extinguish is ignoring her given name. So if you call her for dinner and she ignores you, instead of going to find her or giving in and calling her to the table by her preferred name, you might let her miss a few dinners. By removing something wanted, dinner, you may extinguish or discourage the target behavior, which is your child ignoring her given name. In another book by authors Maria Rice Hayson and Theresa Fernand titled Get Out Now, Why You Should Pull Your Child from Public School Before It's Too Late, pretty self-explanatory from the title, in the second chapter titled Schools, Preaching and Enforcing the LGBT Gospel, the authors alarm that, with little advance notice to parents, public schools have moved quickly to comply with the progressive mandates for LGBTQ inclusivity, which means gender ideology is permeating schools from coast to coast. Pretty much one of the tactics that Christian conservatives employ when dealing with their intolerance of queerness is to socially isolate the queer person, cutting off all contact with the outside world and sheltering them in this bubble where they can pretend that this queer person is the only person in the world who feels this way. Therefore, it is them who are the problem that needs to pray and repent. Which is why something as simple as even insinuating that a teacher may have a same-sex partner in school gets them so riled up because it allows even the slightest possibility that could burst this bubble that they have worked so hard to keep their children in. Now, all of these things are easier to do when your kids are still young, because they're still under your care for the most part, children are easier to control and manipulate, hence a lot of these resources are catered to parents with school-aged children, sort of like brainwash them while they're still young kind of thing. But when they get older, legally become an adult, and choose to leave home for college, the parents don't have that level of control over their children anymore. Thus, it causes them to panic and see college campuses in a nefarious light. Because most college campuses that hold progressive values and openly support the LGBT and other marginalized groups and actually encourage people to think outside the box is a nightmare for conservatives. Remember what I said about college causing people to open their mind and allowing them to grow as a person by forcing you to interact with people that are different to you? That is exactly what they fear. I mean, can you imagine? What if your kid comes across someone who is gay and ends up thinking that that is actually okay to be that way? Gay people are not inherently groomers and pedophiles? Uh, what? <laughs> But if you still need more proof as to how much these conservatives are really against freedom of speech or freedom in general, look no further as to how they react to what they claim to be 
useless degrees and courses like philosophy, sociology, and of course, gender studies. This was one of their main targets a couple years ago, back when this sort of content was popping off on YouTube. Because, you know, if you come out saying that you're against college altogether, that sounds unhinged. Instead, you back yourself up by saying, oh no, I'm not against college. I mean, if you want to be a doctor, a lawyer, or an engineer, sure, go to college for that. But if you want to major in gender studies, that's pretty pointless. Nobody needs a gender studies major. Is it fair to say that all of this stuff is garbage? That all of these journals are garbage? I think it's pretty fair to say that. Radical left political activist departments at the universities, women's studies being at the top of the, of the list, have done nothing but produce a never-ending stream of ideologically-minded counter-civilization political activists. Feminists use too many pretentious words to make it sound like they're not just pulling it out of their asses. More notably, anti HGW channel by the name of Sagan of Akkad, run by Carl Benjamin, went as far as to organizing a petition calling for suspension of social justice courses with a letter to universities. It's never specified what universities he's talking about throughout the petition that just reads, suspend social justice courses. Yeah, that... <laughs> That's about it. No clarification of what he means by social justice, what courses in particular he's talking about. J just get rid of all of them. And of course, we have Matt Walsh from his 2022 documentary, What is a Woman, who interviewed a gender studies professor only to cut him off mid-sentence. What we do in, in gender studies is not just reduce gender to what psychologists might call individual differences, but rather thinking about gender. And that's not women and man, but gender as a, as a social form, something that kind of infuses itself into virtually all aspects of social life. Let's talk about that then. Uh, I guess we should start with, we've got gender and sex, right? Yeah. What, what's the difference between the two? Is there a difference? I saw that in your questions and I thought, my goodness, this is what we spend an entire semester kind of thinking through. But what we tend to think about in the social sciences today is that sex refers to a set of biological characteristics and gender is a social construct or category. What I think is often misleading about that characterization is allowed to be sort of messy and complicated. But in that framing, when you split them up into these wholly discrete constructs, study scholars, and, and really more specifically people who study gender and sex, we're not talking about sexuality right now. In the kind um, of academic universe that I travel in is that we see how deeply gendered ideas, um, cultural ideas about masculinity, uh, femininity, maleness, and femaleness, both in humans and in lots of other animals. I think out of all the examples that I showed, this is the one that pisses me off the most. Imagine a professor, an academic, who has spent a significant amount of his life dedicated to studying this topic, taking time out of his busy schedule to sit down with you for an interview that you yourself have set up, only for you to not even listen to what he has to say, but also humiliating him with over-the-top music and dismissing his field of study. It's okay if you don't understand nor care about gender studies. There are plenty of things I don't know, nor do I care enough to know. Say, quantum mechanics. I don't care, my knowledge of physics only goes up to a few classes that I've taken back in high school. But I would never go up to, say, a physics academic who has done a PhD in quantum mechanics and go, yeah, all that years and decades you have spent studying this is all pointless. I mean, what gives you the right to say that, especially when you yourself have admitted to not even going to college? Can you give us a summary of your educational background or your healthcare education experience? Mr. Walsh, you recognized. Um, also, I, I did. Now, it's true. I didn't. I didn't go to college. If anything, you can argue that learning about the metaphysics of gender and how it interplays with the society that we live in is far more applicable to the real world than learning about minuscule particles that isn't even visible to the eye. But something tells me that Matt Walsh wouldn't be as dismissive in that case. 
So gender studies is an interdisciplinary academic field that analyzes gender identities and representation, as well as intersections of other identities like queer studies, women's studies, African American studies, and so on and so forth. This sort of courses that fall under the liberal arts, humanities, philosophy umbrella are designed to enrich your critical thinking by questioning the status quo, thus developing skills like creativity, empathy, understanding, which are far from being useless, as these are the skills that land many liberal arts majors jobs in reputable fields. Yes, people with arts degrees do have jobs. So the myth of liberal arts and humanities being useless is not due to those topics having no real-world applications, but rather it's because they are chronically underfunded and underprioritized by the government. Because for most people, once they start to critically examine the world around them, like these courses force you to do, it often leads to them questioning and challenging the authority and wanting to change the system and the status quo, which is discouraged, especially by those who act benefit from the system. As George Carlin once said, governments don't want well-informed, well-educated people capable of critical thinking. That is against their interest. They want obedient workers, people who are just smart enough to run the machines and do the paperwork and just dumb enough to passively accept it. I have never really understood the concept of useless degrees, because even if you do struggle to find a job after graduating with your arts degree, like many STEM graduates do as well by the way, the knowledge, the skills and the connections that you made in college, especially in courses like gender studies that teaches critical thinking skills, can still be invaluable and set you up for life. But even then, if somebody wants to study about genders in college and has the means to do so, who gives a shit? Like, seriously, why do you even care so much? I thought this was the party of freedom. So much about the left wanting to brainwash the youth with their dogmatic beliefs, yet here we are in 2023, conservatives are banning books, banning gender studies major and diversity programs in schools, and thus actively stifling academic freedom. <sighs> There is a saying that goes, every conservative accusation is a confession, and I think it fits pretty well here. Then we have the obvious trolling. I think this is where I would put people like Stephen Crowder, Caitlin Bennett, and Milo Yiannopoulos, as even under the guise of debate, they rarely ever bring up arguments that are worth discussing. Instead, they just seem to be saying or doing the most inflammatory things imaginable just to get a reaction out of people. I've um I've taken some time out of my busy schedule, being fabulous and doing my hair, to prepare a speech for you. Well, a few remarks, really. Feminism is cancer. Thank you very much. Even with the SJW compilations that often shed light on a person's worst moments, unfortunately, this sort of content does well and gets promoted by the algorithm because it is entertaining to see somebody lose their shit. This is on the same vein as public freakout videos, gamer rage, this is how many people like angry video game nerd from Cinemassacre got their channel started. But when it is done at the expense of marginalized groups as well as exploiting the youth, it raises a question of ethics. I mean this in the least patronizing way possible, but as someone who is a young person myself, young people generally do tend to be more emotional about the things that we are passionate about, and as the younger generations do tend to be more progressive and educated, we can sometimes be a bit too vocal about the things that we know which can get exploited. This also ties in with the ageism that is often directed towards young people as it is not uncommon to hear people say in such cases, oh, what do these young people still living with their parents know about the world? Telling me what I can and can't say. Who the hell does this guy think he is? Some college kid's gonna come in and tell us our ways are old? And while you can say, oh, it's just all fun and games, they're just trolling people in college campuses, but it's not really when they're implicitly pushing an agenda by portraying college as this unhinged place played by political correctness. So what effect is this sort of content that portrays college in such a negative light having on people? While it is difficult to know the full scope of impact this sort of content is having, 
Back in 2016 to 2017, when it was trending, I remember some of the people that I was friends with at the time in high school saying that they don't want to pursue higher education after school because of political correctness and identity politics in campuses. And this was in Australia, where I live, miles away from the US, where this rhetoric was being pushed. So I can't even imagine the impact it would have had on you if you were in the US, where these sorts of things were actually happening. Over the last couple of years, the conservatives have come out to be openly against college or higher education in general. Last year, Charlie Kirk from Turning Point USA came out with his book, The College Scam, How America's Universities Are Bankrupting and Brainwashing Away the Future of America's Youth, where he takes an active stance against colleges. And the worst part is, some of the points that are brought up by Charlie, like the student loan debt, being unable to find a job after graduating, are valid, legitimate points. So most people don't know that 40% of people that enroll in four-year college will not graduate. They will drop out. And then on top of that, if you graduate from college, that means if you get through that first 40%, you're part of the 60%, another 40% end up getting a job that does not require a college degree. And as much as I don't like Charlie, he is correct that up to 40% of undergraduate students in America do drop out. But what he fails to mention is that the main reason behind this is because they simply can't afford it anymore, which puts them in an even more difficult situation as students with a bachelor's degree can have a lifetime earning that is up to $1 million more than those with merely a high school diploma. Even if you do end up with a job that wouldn't require you to have a degree, oftentimes for you to even get an interview, a college degree is required to be on your resume. College dropouts are nearly two times more likely to be unemployed than college graduates. But being the conservative that he is, Charlie just had to chalk up all these issues not as systemic failures but as wokeism. And I'm not even touching on the wokeism, the indoctrination, the awful ideas. Colleges have become the point of origination of the worst aspects of American society. And the only solution he provides is to just not go to college and pick up a trade instead like welding, carpentry or mechanic. No one wants to admit to their neighbors that their kid is working construction. Becoming a carpenter, a welder or a mechanic, even if you have strong values and a big family and you're wonderfully married. And while that's all well and good, I have nothing against people that choose to do such professions. But again, what Charlie fails to mention is that doing trades like welding, carpentry or mechanic is not going to make you much money at this day and age. This is not the 50s anymore where you could sustain a family of four with a single income working at a union-backed factory job. Gone were the days where these sorts of jobs were unionized and could pay a living wage. Now, college graduates make 84% higher than those with just a high school diploma. Despite all the issues with our education system, for many people, getting that degree may as well be the ticket that could lift them out of poverty. To me, it is pretty obvious that antagonizing colleges and painting them in such a negative light is an attempt from Charlie Kirk and other conservatives to keep people poor and downtrodden, to keep them at the bottom of the social hierarchy so that they could have their power at the top by having a working class to rule over. Coupled with the fact that college is supposed to teach you critical thinking skills by questioning authority, discouraging people from going to college is also going to keep them more naive gullible and easily manipulated to their rhetoric that ultimately benefits those at the top. I think now is a good time to bring up that I myself actually did not go to college or university rather is what we call it here. Although I am thinking of going back next year, but it's a long story that I don't really want to get into right now. But for me, it was one of the best decisions I have made as it gave me more time to become financially stable, think about what I really want to do and get my mental health sorted out. And guess what? Despite not even going to college, I am still as liberal as you can be. So checkmate conservatives. <laughs> But this is where I want to end this video. If college is something you want to do, cool. If not, that's also cool. But do keep in mind that given the way the job market is right now, going to college can be more financially beneficial in the long term. 
But whatever you do, don't let your decisions be influenced by some manufactured outrage that isn't even real by people who themselves have been to college. Yes, most of these conservative pundits that I mentioned in this video that have been dunking on colleges are college graduates themselves. And it's not from STEM majors, but from liberal arts and humanities. You know, the ones that they claim to be useless. Is it fair to say that all of this stuff is garbage? That all of these journals are garbage? I think it's pretty fair to say that. The universities have figured out how to conspire in some sense to pick the future pockets of the students that they're purporting to, to um, educate. And they're not educating them, they're indoctrinating them. Is college still worth it? How about your average sociology major, political science major at fill-in-the-blank state U? You're not conservative and you're traumatized. It is not possible to overstate how pathetic the existence of these safe spaces is. Ah, the classic, do as I say, but not as I do. But pretty much, do what you want. As long as you have the means to do so and are not harming anyone, study whatever you're passionate about, even if it's gender studies, or don't study anything at all. Either way, you have my full support. Because unlike some people, I, for one, actually care about something called freedom.